Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the January edition of the Pitchmasters Workshop. Happy and healthy new year to everyone. We are excited to be here with three fabulous entrepreneurs. Um, Seedspot is our partner in crime of Pitchmasters. We have Lauren McDaniel from Seedspot and our guest judge today, but welcome back, our Pitchmasters favorite guest judge, Paul Martin. Uh, my name is Lisa Freelander. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer over here at Next, powered by Shulman Rogers. Next is an innovative legal model for the delivery of legal services to startup and emerging growth companies. I'd love to take a few minutes and just to have our get judges introduce themselves. Lauren, I'll kick it over to you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. So excited to hear three pitches this morning. My name is Lauren, and I am from a nonprofit that uh, does programming all over the U.S. for impact-driven entrepreneurs who are looking to make a positive difference through the new businesses that they start. I'll pass it to Hall. Great, thanks, Lauren. My name is Hall Martin. I'm the founder of 10 Capital. We're based out of Austin, but cover the US. And we help startups and investors connect for funding. And we do pitch events a great deal and looking forward to the pitches today to give you feedback on it and uh, look for next steps. Terrific. Thank you both, as always, for being here and being so de dedicated to Pitchmasters. Um, well, without further ado, I'm going to kick it off to our first entrepreneur, Chris Lean. Feel free to go ahead and share your screen. And once you get started, I'll start the clock. Thank you so much, Lisa. Appreciate it. Um, I'll start now. So I'm Chris Lean. This is Dark Block. So content creators just simply aren't making enough money. And one of the big reasons is that these big web two platforms have all the control, YouTube, Spotify, even uh, platforms like Netflix, they, they treat the creators the way that they want to, the, the way that platforms want to treat them. They're not focused on quality, they're focused on quantity. And as a result, we have a very long tail of creators that simply can't make enough money. So Web3 has been getting a lot of buzz because it promises to give more control to creators. Um, there's a lot of, you know, kind of Web2 players that are kind of edging in on Web3 with uh, uh, concepts like Patreon, OnlyFans, Substack, where they give uh, people the ability to kind of monetize their content direct directly, but they're not going far enough. We think that Web3 uh, represents the next step where creators have the control of their communities, things are portable. Uh, and we think that basically we need Web3 native solutions to give creators uh, the business models that really will work for them. So Dark Block is Web3's missing monetization layer when it comes to content. Right now, people are just selling NFTs, basically just pictures of monkeys, uh, trying to uh, uh, make a profit off of the, the next person. We don't think that that is going to work for content. We, we need something more to enable content to be monetized properly in Web3. So what we build at DarkBlock is a protocol that enables people to encrypt and permanently store content and control access to it with NFTs. So basically we built this, this protocol that makes content very highly composable and extensible, uh, Web3 compatible, but still allows you to employ Web2 business models such as rental, subscriptions, and, and also guarantee royalties. So basically, you know, we, we're enabling people to monetize the consumption of content, not just trying to sell an NFT of a JPEG. So as I mentioned, like this is about monetization. We have built monetization directly into our protocol to ensure that the right people can get paid. So royalties are kind of a big concern when it comes to NFTs. Uh, when you sell an NFT, the royalties are actually uh, you know, optional for the marketplace. You're seeing marketplaces kind of fight over whether or not they should be paying royalties. But when it comes to content, since we're building the ability to take those payments directly into the protocol, we can guarantee that the right players uh, get paid. So the creators can set up rules for how their content is monetized. And then uh, basically the, the people that buy the content can go forth and monetize it, which is kind of an interesting paradigm. It's kind of like an affiliate model. 
So here's a use case, uh, unlockable content for NFTs. We have now three marketplaces that we have uh, gone live with where we power unlockable content for NFTs. Uh, another one, Night Market, is coming very soon. We have finished the technical integration, but they're still waiting to launch. Exchange.art is another. Uh, and we have several different uh, partner projects that are using unlockable content for NFTs as a way to increase value. So this is uh, something that's pretty straightforward in the NFT community, but what we're doing is we're taking a Web3 approach. Rather than using an NFT control access to control access to a website, we're making it native to Web3, enabling that content to flow with the NFT wherever it is sold, and that person who buys it is guaranteed access forever. And then also the monetization built on top where we can enable people to monetize access to that content, we think is a very powerful concept that we think uh, is ready to explode. There are a number of Web3 native content projects out there. Omega Runner is one of our partners uh, that, that is basically building an entire world, uh, but native to Web3. So they're issuing NFTs, in the future uh, profile picks so people can buy characters from this universe. But they're right now they're releasing comic books uh, with Dark Block, which we think is an excellent use case because when it comes to NFTs, basically if you sell a comic book as an NFT without Dark Block, anybody can go view it. So this is, allows people to basically control their distribution and actually make money off the actual content in Web3. Crowdfunding is another awesome use case for uh, Dark Block. Um, basically, content creators can actually take sales of NFTs up front and then enable uh, their community to be an investor in the content that's created. So they can go create the content, drop it to the NFTs that they sold to do the crowdfunding, and then give those people exclusive access and also in the future, the ability to monetize. So, Running out of time here. So uh, we also take a, 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 a percentage of the value that's created. So since we're building monetization into the protocol, the value that's created with this content, we can take a part of, which is kind of a difference uh, between us and other level one chains. So we do have competitors. Uh, most of them are web two, um, but we really differentiate ourselves by building monetization into the protocol. So we've got a great team. I'd uh, love to talk to anybody who's interested in you know, what we've built so far, uh, where we're going about the team, but thank you very much, appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for ending um, right at six minutes. R super interesting what you guys are doing. Um, Hall, do you wanna kick us off with um, some comments? Sure, you know, it's uh, I think a brave new world there with the NFTs, the creator community is a great one to go after. My, my first question is, in the creator community, are you focused particularly on the, the comic book sector or what other beachhead markets are you looking to get into? And I'm sure it's opportunistic at this point, but why are we choosing those, those entry points into the market? Yeah, so we basically talk with creators and uh, other partners about what features they would like to enable in the product, and, and that kind of determines our path. So. Um, we have a, a number of people at the company that are kind of just very into uh, Web3 in general and know a lot of people. And so we're able to kind of get in front of creators, try to kind of test the waters to see what they would like and kind of build accordingly. So as a result, you know, we have a number of partners that are building a wide variety of solutions that we think we can uh, all, you know, we can basically provide a lot of value for because we see dark block as a kind of a, a ground layer piece of infrastructure for web three content. In order to monetize content, you need to be able to control access to it. Even in the case of advertising, um, you need access controls in order to make sure people can't just view it for free. So, um, but you know, as far as the use cases go, we're, we're basically mostly letting our partners kind of run with whatever use case works for them. Okay. What is your take rate on each of these NFTs? That's your business model. What is that percent? <laughs> so uh, we have not started charging money yet. Uh, we are uh, enabling monetization very soon, uh, built into the protocol, and we will take a small percentage of all of that activity. 
So basically 2.5% of any kind of monetization, including rental, pay-per-view, subscription, et cetera. And how's that compared to the competition? So the competition is, is basically largely uh, centered around sales, which is a very hard thing to get a piece of. So uh, we decided that the value is actually created when you give people access to the content. And since we are controlling that with our protocol, and we can build monetization around that that concept that we can actually take a guaranteed percentage of the activity. Okay, great. And how, how do you contrast compare this to just a basic e-commerce platform? Would you say it's that or not? So yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely uh, uh, web two ways of doing this. You could just go on, um, you know, Squarespace and create a website, control access to uh, some videos, or use Patreon for that as well. But what we're doing is we're enabling people to actually buy a piece of the content. So they actually own a piece of it and then they can actually monetize it themselves based on the rules that the creator sets up. So this is like an asset that they can go forth and make money on just like uh, other physical assets. Great, are you raising money? We are, yes. Um, yeah, so we, we, we did a previous raise of 1.85 million uh, end of 2021. And we're out raising a seed round right now. Okay, great. Lauren, do you have any questions? Great questions. Um, I'm curious about uh, Chris. What? Where are you at with development so far? Yeah, so we are launched. Uh, I would consider it a, a beta product. So you know the underlying network uh, that does the actual encryption and protection of the content. Um, that is not fully decentralized yet. That's kind of a journey for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, have released a version that uses all the same principles as the decentralized version, but we are running the network ourselves until we are absolutely certain that it is fully secure. But then basically we will turn that over um, to anybody to run and earn money for powering the network. Great. And what is your um, strategy for getting not the creators, but the buyers um, onto the platform? Yeah, so for us, it starts with creators. For, okay. We're giving them flexible business models around their content. If their audiences really want to consume that content, we think that they will come with them. But you know, this is not something that can be dictated to users. You know, it needs to be more collaborative. So you know, we expect them to have a conversation with their community and to test things out, you know, uh, every community is going to be different in how much they are willing to kind of move into this Web3 centric model. Um, but we're, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for them by allowing them to use credit cards, um, by abstracting the NFTs away from, you know, uh, you know, we don't want them to become Web3 experts in order mm -hmm. to consume content, but we still want the benefits of Web3 uh, to be enabled as well. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, Difficult game, but you know we'll we'll start with the Web three kind of centric people, and then move into people that are kind of more mainstream Web two. Is like Patreon, for example, a case study that you might be looking at for like um, creators getting their communities into a central platform? Yeah, so you know there are certainly people on Patreon that could benefit from more flexibility. So. We are in the process right now of, of interviewing some Web2 kind of creators to see what problems we could solve for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we know that there's a lot of problem with uh, YouTube kind of blocking people um, for whatever reason. You know, they, their their algorithms tend to be very draconian in how they approach, uh, you know, copyright protection, for example. So, you know, we want to reach out to uh, those those. Uh, YouTubers that basically are having their content demonetized or they're being deplatformed completely mm -hmm. and present this as another option for them to engage with their community, enable them to own a part and also uh, release the content that you know they want to release. I think it will be interesting as Hall was mentioning these uh, specific types of creators. I think that might be an interesting strategy as you go to market um, to think about you know what genres or or you know media um i also just wanted to say that i thought the way that you explained the problem with problem part one of um 
uh, creators not getting enough funding and then problem part two, web two, um, I thought that was excellent. Um, the two opportunities that I think your pitch has is I'd love to see some diagrams or some information flows, especially I think as you're talking about web two and web three, maybe just visualizing, hey, this is where they're the same, this is where they're different. So you are doing some good education there. And then secondly, in the use case um, slide, you had the, the title, let me show you a use case. Then you talked about the comic book company in the next slide. And I was really craving a story in the use case. So okay. maybe there's an opportunity there to kind of mush those two together. But thank you for the pitch. Very, very, very interesting. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for the feedback. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Lauren and Hall. And thank you, Chris. Great job. You can go ahead and stop sharing. And we will move on to Cecil, our next presenter. Cecil, go ahead and share your screen. And when you're ready to get started, I will start the timer. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific, the floor is yours. Uh, Cecil, you're still on mute. <laughs> there you go, Cecil. Oh, nope. <laughs> All right, you ready to get started? Yes. All right, the floor is yours. All right, how you guys doing? My name is Cecil Griffin. I'm the owner of Chicken Grease Media. And today we are going to be talking about my new application called Grease. So Grease is, is my baby project. It is my second application that I am bringing to market. Um, what we are trying to do is we are creating the first food media, social media platform. So with Greece, what we are trying to do is we are connecting on a global platform, chefs, cooks, private cooks, anybody who creates food media, and we are connecting them directly with their clientele and their viewers. And we are building a commerce network and uh, exchange of recipes, cookbooks, um, and ideas with the um with the consumers of food media on a social media platform so food media is one of the top um top medias consumed on social media um with over 13 million uh downloads with um cookbooks ranging um over millions of views and millions of downloads, whether it be Amazon or direct from the um, chefs, we are trying to create a central home location for all these activities. So in building, in building this um, mobile application, um, we, we came across a few problems when, uh, that we wanted to create solutions for. So with the mobile, mobile application, um, for the people searching for food recipes, whether it's cooking dinner for the family, or I wanna learn how to make sushi, or I wanna learn how to make a tagine in Morocco, any of these kind of um, international food presentations that we wanna present, um, you catch yourself going on different social media platforms, looking for ideas, looking for concepts, looking for things you wanna, um, cook for yourself or cook for your family, and you kind of get lost in the sauce, you know, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, there's a mix of everything, all information all around the world. So what we're doing is we're centralizing that. So by creating this platform, we are literally going to have a timeline feed where people can literally like you're scrolling TikTok and be watching food videos from all over the world. You'll be able to direct connect to the chef. You'll be able to talk to the chef. You'll be able to, or the, I like to call uh, food media content creator. You'll be able to talk to the content creator. You'll be able to um, place your, your, um, your recipes that you make from the creator on a timeline wall. You'll be able to connect with other people. 
And one of the biggest things, one of the biggest uh, advantages of somebody who is watching the content is for the first time ever, when connecting with a cook or when connecting with a food meter creator, you'll be able to take the recipes that you love, the recipes that you like, and not only will you be able to make them, but you'll be able to convert them to a Walmart pickup order or delivery order, which is an international group. And that'll cut out all the middleman. So now you can directly make the product in your house. So you don't got to worry about a HelloFresh sending you a random recipe. You don't got to worry about, oh, I liked how it looked, but I don't know where to go get the items or do I really want to put this energy into it together to actually do it. We are cutting out all the middleman and we are bringing everything into one home. Now, for those providing content, this is the true advantage. When I created my first platform, I made it so that it was a direct connect from my um, the people that view my content on Chicken Grease Media to be able to purchase content directly. But I wanted to make a platform where everybody can do that. So now all the all the food media creators that are that are buying groceries, editing content, making content, and building their platforms, they'll still be able to provide content to every platform they want to. But here, they can they can actually sell their content. They can still make content for viewing purposes, but to be able to purchase your content directly, it makes a world of difference. And for me, it comes down to a numbers game. Because if I am a content creator and I have 5,000 um, 5, followers between all my platforms, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera, if I am able to sell a dollar recipe to 50% of those, uh, those followers a week, I now don't have to work anymore. I now can create content from home so that I can provide my content, my food, my recipes to the world and then still be able to provide my family and build a business off of that as well. So once again, go into the Grease user, you'll be able to find recipe books. You'll be able to learn from cooks around the world. The advantage of, of Grease is instead of, go, once again, going to other platforms and keep going through looking for stuff and just kind of get lost in the sauce, I'll be able to go to Grease and say, hmm, I wonder if there's a Japanese chef in Tokyo that I can learn some good sushi techniques from. With Grease, you'll be able to do that. With Grease, you'll be able to not just find that person, you'll also be able to bring those products home to be able to work on that item as well. For the content creator, once again, we are you are building your audience in Greece, but in building your audience, you can create content in Greece and still spread it out to all the other platforms. And then Eagle, you're I'm gonna in. have to interrupt, I'm so sorry. You're over six yeah. minutes. Can you just spend a second wrapping it up? Yes. So basically, we are creating a home for food media. We are tapping into the original, one of the original um, usages of Instagram, which was uh, food media to, um, to basically spread love, spread food, make money, and, and build businesses for other people so that we can create a home for everything food related. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, really appreciate it. Um, super exciting um, opportunity. Lauren, do you wanna kick off with comments this time? Yes, I do. Uh, Cecil, thank you so much for putting your passion and your experience, your years of experience, not only it sounds like as a, as a foodie and, and a food content creator and perhaps chef um, yeah. yourself, <laughs> <years>. but, <laughs> chef, um, but also your experience um, launching platforms and, and being an entrepreneur. So super invigorating to hear your passion um, and your understanding of this industry shine through. My biggest piece of advice for you right now is on your problem slide, mm -hmm. I think you were identifying uh, several different, very valid, very real problems that might be able to be distilled for focus sake mm -hmm. through a root cause analysis um, exercise. So in other words, 
Um, here's all the problems that, you know, 20 plus years in the industry, I'm seeing this leads to this leads to this leads to this. There's a relationship between these problems here. Um, there's several great tools and, and I, I have one actually um, at SeedSpot that I'm happy to share on how to really distill that down into what is that first core problem and the very discrete core problem that this venture is going to start with solving. And, you know, it's, it's difficult because you usually have to slice off like a piece of that bigger problem and, and, you know, kind of put your blinders on to the rest. Um, but really getting that focus as you get started to say, you know, what is the one of all these things? What is the one problem that is the most important for us to solve? And then what might that trickle effect be? And okay. I think then that will help like your six minute presentation, for example, I think that will help you be able to get to that problem. Then talking about the effects of that, how you monetize that um, really, uh, you know, more clearly and concisely for your audience. So something that I see with entrepreneurs all the time um, and just, I mean, what I think it speaks to is just your level of experience and your level of passion. Um, but that would be not my number one piece of advice. And I think that um, SeedSpot could definitely help you with that. So if you're interested, I'm happy to share some resources with you. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks, Lauren. Hall? Sure. Yeah. Great presentation. See, so I thought the, the, the slides had a really nice look to it. My, my one comment is there's there's quite a few words on the slide. And I find uh, no matter how many words you put up there, the audience feels compelled to read every one of them. And if you put too many words they're they're reading your slides and they're not listening to you. And the last thing you want to do is have them not listen to you. So I, I go back and just work the, the, the slides so that there's fewer words up there and it's, it's supporting you as opposed to you supporting the slides because you're the presentation for the most part. My, my first question is, do you have any users on the platform yet? No, we're looking to go into beta in the springtime. Um, right now we're currently finalizing. Um, there's a lot of social media rules. So we're diving into those right now, but the, um, the platform is built, the website is built. Um, and like I said, we're looking to go into beta during this, uh, right before the spring. Do you have any strategy for putting an initial group of people on there? Is it people you know, or are you buying a list, or are you partnering with somebody else? So what, what's your strategy to get the initial base up on um, looking at it? Um, what we're doing, so I'm going to be utilizing my platform as well as my, um, my networks. And then um, I've already started building, but I'm going to continue building. Um, the advantage of using social media is that I can connect to chefs and cooks and creators all over the world. So we're constantly connecting, constantly um, building a, a network for Greece so that when we do launch beta and then when we go into the next launch, we'll have people to start on the platform. Right. Well, one idea is to go find existing groups out there that you think this would fit for existing communities or networks and then go and say for you guys, I'm going to give you this special free version It's going to solve your problem. And as, as Lauren said, pick one problem and solve it at no cost and, and and basically try to get that network using yours. You always want to start with an existing network versus building something from the ground up with just you, your, you and your best friends because it's, it's, it takes a long time. So if you can tap into existing networks networks and convert them over, that's, that's going to be a little bit faster to build up more people. And it, it can build a little bit more virality into the program as well. Um, my, my, my last question was, what is your competitive advantage? What, what is differentiating you from everybody else? Because this is a fairly competitive space. There is a lot of groups out there in the food space, and there's a lot of people coming at it from different angles. They share recipes, they share cuisine, they share stories, whatever. Uh, what, what, what do you think is going to be the one thing you do that no one else is doing? So one, one of the, I've been asked this question a lot. One of the um, biggest advantages is not just the connectivity on the social media level of, you know, being able to find people and talk directly to chef and things of that nature. But when I look at other apps, like say a food network app, they only utilize their people. So this this opportunity is for anybody. It's like signing on to TikTok or signing on Instagram. Anybody can sign on and build as far as a creator or even somebody who's viewing. And then also the connectivity with the Walmart pickup order and delivery order. 
kind of cancels out a lot of other people because it's not just oh this is one of my favorite chefs and i'm just going to make this recipe it's no the food is on the way i can show people and connect to people directly so creating that social media platform and um given an opportunity to provide the um items to actually produce the food and then being able to share that to the other social media platforms um, in a similar style uh, where TikTok does, where it has a little uh, symbol at the bottom so you know where it came from, and then building off of that. Right. So what I recommend you do is go pick your top 10 chefs that are out there on Instagram or whichever platform you're using, and you go to those guys and say, hey, I can enable a community around your stuff at no charge for six months, and then after that is four ninety nine a user. The, you know that the idea is to start with an existing community, and if you're really enabling people to connect with a chef, and a chef wants to connect with a community, then I would start with a chef who may already have a little bit of a community, and then go in. That's your target, and do a beta with one of those chefs to you know see how that goes. And at at this stage, you you don't measure revenue; you measure engagement how many people are logging on, how many people come back, how many people ask questions. It's all about engagement at this point. But I make a list of your top 10 chefs that you would love to work with and then start knocking on the door and say, hey, we'll, we'll help build more of a community and use our tool for that. And then as you get uh, traction and so forth, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how to monetize that. Awesome, awesome. And then also to go with that, um, and I appreciate that a lot, um, because of all the data we'll be gathering um, with uh, with using this this Walmart tool, the the other advantage is it creates a way easier um, market tool to build with. Um, like I, I always use sushi as an example, but if I'm using uh, soy sauce and everybody's buying soy sauce in Madison, Wisconsin, we're gonna know for brands. It'll be a lot easier for brands to connect directly with creators, which will also help build as well so it's a it's an all-around just food business monster <laughs> great and are you raising funding um we we are looking for i i started this one off of a grant program so i'm currently looking for uh, more grants to to build especially for the marketing i recommend you get a convertible note you know 250k and and have that ready so as people say hey i want to be in you know it's you're in a place to take money uh for that and I say convertible note, because if you get into equity with setting valuation, uh, you don't want to make investors at the early stage, you know, climb the paywalls valuation, uh, I say. So the idea is a convertible note doesn't set the valuation. So it's easy, you know, just write 25K check, you're in the deal, don't worry about it. We'll figure out all the other details later. But you always want to be in a place you can raise money as well. And if you have a vision of doing data analytics, I put a slide in there about that, and I call that a roadmap slide at this point. We plan to sell our data in the future. We're not selling it now because it takes a lot of data to make it make it work, but you just communicate we're collecting all of our data into clean, well-structured sets, and we're going to go on the data markets, and we're going to sell it. Uh, in a, in a you know in the future, which is really about two years from now. It, and, but every time you use the app, you're collecting data, and that'll enable you to do the data analytics later when you get to it. And you'll find that makes your total available market bigger, your your revenue bigger, and more. You'll get more interest from investors if you put the data thing on it as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, uh, all. Great. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Cecil. Um, I put in some things in the chat in terms of. We had a Heather Lover of Perfectly Pitched is one of our partners as well, and she delivers a great workshop. I put the link to the YouTube um, page for it. It is brilliant in terms of, of both how to create the and the perfect pitch deck, but also how to deliver it. And Cecil, I, I agree, Lauren. I think you have so much great information. Six minutes is actually a long time. You'll like almost never get six minutes to pitch. So your homework is to go home and try to distill all of that, you know, into three, try three, and then you can always sort of expand from there. But I added the link in the chat because it's really a phenomenal workshop. Um, she's done it uh, with a couple of times oh, for sorry. us now. Um, the link doesn't work for me. I don't know if it works for anyone else. Oh, does it not work for anybody else? It just sends me to the YouTube page. Um, okay, let me work on that. It should become, it should go to our YouTube page, okay. next.law. That's correct. 
but it's not sending you to the specific video. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I'm just getting, I, I mean, I can just Google it, um, next.law YouTube and have it load over. Um, no, it's just sending me to the YouTube homepage. I don't know, maybe it's just my computer. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna put it in here again. It's the December 22nd YouTube. You can find it on next.law. Just click on our YouTube page um, and you'll find it. Oh, wait, that uh, one works, yeah. Okay, great. All right. Well, Lily, it is now your turn. You're up. So feel free to share your screen and we'll start the clock when you're ready. Okay, sure. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, hold on. Okay. We see something, but it's more of a blank white screen. And in the meantime, while Lily's getting that ready, I also put the link in. We have some openings for February Pitch Masters Workshop. If anybody would like to apply to participate and present um, or just to attend, but we do have some openings for some entrepreneurs to actually pitch in February um, and thereafter as well. So grab that link when you can. Um, Lily, any updates? We can't hear you, Lily. Do you want to stop? Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, try again. No, I was talking. I think it, it won't. Here, I'm not going to share the audio. I, can you still hear me now? I think it won't let me share the tab audio while I'm talking, but you can hear me okay. now, right? We can hear you now. Correct. Okay. Great. <laughs> But yeah, all it is supposed see... to be a white screen. Yeah, so that's what I was it saying. And then... be... Oh, okay, great. <laughs> and then I realized you couldn't hear me because I had already said, it. I'm sorry. Um, all right, anyways, you're I... ready to start? <laughs> yes. Perfect, go um, right ahead, okay. thank you. Well, I, so yeah, basically I was at my doctor's office for a gut issue and the doctor told me to eat more fiber, drink more water and exercise. Um, and what I found fascinating is that all these things were recommended to me before even asking me, what I eat um, and what's in my diet and if I had enough fiber. Um, and, and so essentially this is the problem is that with the 68 customers that we've interviewed, what we're finding is a majority of doctors are recommending treatment plans without first looking into nutrition. And we know that food is medicine and food, um, despite knowing that doctors aren't really taking that into consideration. So some other examples include uh, one customer we interviewed who had acne, her whole life and dermatologists gave her treatment after treatment. And she by chance uh, realized, uh, heard from someone that maybe she could cut out dairy and that that would stop her acne. And indeed that did work for her. Um, another example is a customer um, trying to conceive uh, and having trouble to conceive. After a year, the doctors just got her started on IVF, which is a very traumatic procedure for anyone that's done it or been involved. Um, that didn't even work. And one of the things we know is that food and medicine can really um, affect your fertility as well. And so that wasn't looked at either. Um, for the customers that have seen nutritionists, which is a very small subset of them, like two or three of them, um, they have found that one of them found it to be helpful. Um, that, that was because they didn't really uh, know anything about nutrition going in. But if you have a general idea that veggies are good for you, um, and that you, know, you should eat more veggies, um, then nutritionists also provide very vague recommendations. Um, they'll say, oh yeah, we'll keep doing what you're doing, eat more veggies, make sure you have a balance. But uh, again, their recommendations are very vague. So um, why is, oh, and also to Cecil's point earlier, um, nutritionists are 74% white and uh, that doesn't always reflect the diet that people eat. 
Um, so that can also be a mismatch in terms of like what's right for an individual person versus what's the general average recommendation. Um, so why, why is it so hard to give personalized recommendations? Uh, oh, sorry. And the reason is because the leading um, app for giving personalized recommendations is MyFitnessPal. And I don't have the audio on here, but I'm just going to play for you uh, how long it takes to enter an item. Uh, so you have to enter red factors, then you have to select, uh, then you have to look at you have to click the item and then you have to decide um, is it raw red pepper is it cooked red pepper how many grams of red pepper am i eating um, all of this contributes to what president obama says as a dis uh, what, sorry what psychologists call decision fatigue and president obama himself said you need to focus your decision making energy and there's a lot of reasons why people don't track food is because it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, and it's very exhausting. Um, so enter nourisher. Um, so here we can just type in what we ate, a pepper, um, a bunch of other foods that we ate. And if anyone wants to give me a food, I'm happy to type it in. So does anyone just want to shout out a food? Yes, and I, I also wanted to share that we're still looking at the slide that says problem nutritionists provide vague recommendations. Oh, OK. Oh, no, OK. But right. I will shout out, I just had a, a cutie, a clementine. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Clementine, thank you for, uh, yeah, the, the previous page I shared was just uh, a YouTube video of a uh, person going through my fitness pal and um, it taking like about 30 seconds for you to enter just one food item. Um, but here we're entering all our food. Um, it looks like clementine is not in here, so. <laughs> Well, let's um, say orange. Yeah. Okay. Let's do orange. Let's do that. That should be in here. Perfect. Um, so here it recommended items to optimize your nutrition. I'm um, so telling you, you know, um, you're low in fat and protein, sodium Lily, fiber. Lily, forward, forward your deck. We're now we're still looking at the video. Okay. Sorry. Um, yes. Okay. So let me... Yeah, so, okay, I'll, I'll just rerun it because it's pretty fast and then you can see it run as proof because that's always fun. Um, so yeah, you can see your, uh, it recommend items to optimize your nutrition. Um, it recommended pickled ginger, brown mushrooms, ground pork. Um, the links take you to Amazon, well, that's a separate thing. Um, but what you can see here is that in general, you're uh, like for my personal nutrition with the addition of oranges, I'm not actually low on fiber. So what actually is the issue with me and my gut? Um, and I can start like figuring out and finding out my personal issue from there because I have this information. So in this chart, we see the nutrition breakdown in green is the um, nutrients that I already eat. And in pink are the nutrients of recommended food items. Um, and we're working on ways to break this down even further so that you can see the breakdown of each item contribution. Um, you can also so say like we're trying to figure out what recommendations people would actually like so we're getting collecting feedback on that um, and then you can also see a breakdown of um, each nutrient and the items and how they contribute to every um, macro and micronutrient and these are definitely not exhaustive we have 33 uh, micro and macronutrients that we look at but for the purposes of this MVP that we built we just have this um, so this is what we're trying to do to solve this problem is that we're trying to make the process of figuring out the foods that we eat and the nutrients in the foods that we eat much faster. And Peter Thiel said, for a company to succeed, to succeed, you have to do something 10 times better and 10 times faster than what currently exists in the market. And we think we have that. Um, Lily, your time's up if you can just wrap up. Okay, sure. Um, we asked people when was the last time you struggled to figure out their nutrients, you know, 50% uh, said either within the last week or today. Uh, market is going by 650%, which is twice as fast as S&P. What we've done so far is 68 customer interviews, 34 in industry interviews, which includes other people who have done food apps, um, several rounds of beta testing with Google Forms and MVP. Right now we're coding the full app. Um, our dream is to bridge the gap between nutrition and disease. We raised 15,000 from our 50,000 goal. Um, and then I come from a data science background. I got my PhD in neuroscience um, and my co-founder uh, is also a technical 
um, engineer. We built the apps together. Um, she's worked at Google. We both have business backgrounds as well. We both come from management consulting. Um, and then here's our advisors and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> and yes, sorry about all the snafus, but you know, it is what it is, so. That's okay, no problem. Thank you, thank you. Looks like a really valuable tool. Um, Lauren, do you wanna kick us off this time? Yes, um, first of all, I love this product and I wanna use it. So <laughs> another customer validation point um, right now. And also, I also just wanted to give you props for not investing right now at this point in a bunch of really built out slides. Um, mm -hmm. I would much rather see, and for those of you that are, you know, building a deck, I would much rather see something like this, Ali, where you've got the basic information down, you're figuring out the flow of the story, you're really highlighting the product and what you've done so far. Um, you can always bring in a designer later, you can always, mm -hmm. um, you know, make it look better later, but sometimes we fall in love with the slides that we spend hours on. And it's harder to change them. So very, very good strategy. I can see the data scientists coming out in you um, mm -hmm. with that. Um, I think that the demo was fantastic and really told a lot of the story. So I think that was a really powerful um, use of your time, Lily. My biggest question throughout until I think the final slide was why Lily? Why you? Like, great you had this experience like i love the personal story at the beginning but are you building this out because you went into the doctor um so i think putting your credentials up into mm -hmm. that first story as well as your um your developer or your co-founder will really help like mute some of those questions that at least for my mind kept popping in mm -hmm. um i'm curious about your revenue strategy mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, revenue strategy. Um, uh, yeah, okay. So we'd like to, uh, just the typical stuff that you hear, um, we're not focused on revenue right now. I think right now we just want to know that we can help people. And on our plate right now is working with a uh, pre-diabetes um, group at the Holy Cross. We're trying to close that right now and see if that will um, help them with their nutrition, with understanding their nutrition moving forward. But the revenue models that we do have include um, oh, B2C first, right? Um, and the prices I have here is 29, but I figure it'll go way lower, like $10. I had it here because I was doing some of this by hand earlier and I just wanted to charge people for my time mostly. Um, but once everything is automated, of course, like we'd love to get it down to $5, $10 a person. Um, even on an annual basis, because we want to make it affordable. Um, and then we also think there could be a way to get sponsored products. The one thing we're seeing in our recommended products is uh, actually a lot of cereal, a lot of mint, a lot of um, dried spices, because spices are very dense in nutrients. Um, so we figured, okay, what if McCormick, McCormick would like be able to sponsor us? Or what if, um, you know, uh, Cheerios, the multigrain version, not the honey nut version, would want to sponsor us? Um, if they were a recommended item. Um, yeah, so, so those are like things we're thinking of, but we haven't finalized yet. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing those. And then my mm -hmm. other, my last question is, can you talk a little bit about any either legal um, implications or, you know, regulations, for example, you know, are, is the company at risk if you tell people, hey, you should really add this to your diet and they become ill? Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, sure. Um, that's a great point. We haven't, uh, to be quite honest, I haven't looked into that um, mostly because I feel like there's a lot of people on Instagram telling people to eat things and they aren't even like uh, certified in any way. <laughs> so um, I think that part of it is, yeah, I, I'll make a point to look into it. So I think that's a great, yeah. Um, but uh yeah look into legal issues um i i do know we did look up like whether or not the web app should be hipaa approved and um basically unless you're collecting like people's social security numbers and their specific identity it doesn't need to be hipaa approved so we're going to go that route for now because it's easier to develop the uh web app but eventually it would be nice to be hipaa approved because then um we could probably get funding uh sorry we could probably get fsa approved 
uh, and once it's FSA approved, just the budget on health products will increase. So yeah, but I will look into the legal issues of like recommending the wrong thing. That said though, I do think about it a lot, like uh, am I recommending things that will hurt someone? Um, so yeah, we don't, we don't take it lightly. Yeah. <laughs> Makes Thanks sense. Lauren. Thank Paul? Great, yeah. I, I think uh, that was a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm very interested in this space as well. I do think nutrition is really the key, uh, should be the fundamental thing we should push. I find in a, in a short presentation like this, there's really the core five things people really need to get are one, the problem, two, the solution, three, the team, four, the traction or monetization, and five, a, a fundraise or an ask. And going back to the problem, I think this is the kind of place where you really don't have to convince people this is a problem. I think you really just need to identify the problem and then move more quickly into the solution. Uh, I've been in presentations where they literally took half the half the time trying to convince me diabetes is a problem. Well, I know diabetes is a problem. I just, you know, what, what are you going to do about it is the question going through everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. And so I would just move more quickly to your solution and put out there the actual product, you know, just so we're going to do X, even if it's an MVP or early stage form, we, we just need to get a context about where you're going to land in the marketplace. Uh, team is critical. And at this stage, what you want is somebody building it, somebody selling it. If you have more people, that's great. But put up there the team that's going to take this to market because that's half of what investors are going to be going after. And it really gives people a, a more of a sense around it. And then next is the traction or the monetization. You got a good B2B and B2C business model up there. I recommend you pick one at this stage just to get some focus on it. Yeah, just so people know yeah. we're going to go after other things. We're definitely B2C first, yeah. Um, and, and I know it's not popular right now with um, venture funding. Uh, people love B2B, but we're we're like a consumer company, so yeah. Right, and, and, and it's, it's a good goal to go up, but just like we were talking with uh, Cecil a moment ago, my recommendation is you pick five sponsors that want to promote this and you go to them first and sign them up uh, for some money. Uh, that'll help fund your business. It will take time to build the the C side of the business, and uh, in that that is expensive. But not to say you can't do it, but you'll find it it's a lot easier to get money from five sponsors than it will be to get it from a hundred users. And because you just knock on five doors, and and there's a there's a contract there for you guys. So if you need money, that's great. And, and the last is if there if there is a fundraise or an ask, and maybe the ask is to use the beta, maybe and give people a way to log in and be a part of it. That would be the last thing. And you, and as we said before, if you have a vision of doing data analytics, I'd put a slide in there about data, just to show we're planning to monetize the data in the future. And we've got a lot of people expressing interest in it. It's more of a story than an actual product at this point, but it's something that really makes it more interesting for people as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we're interested in selling data at the moment, but more like giving consumers the power of data. Because like right now, you don't know, when you go to a hospital, you don't know anything about other people who visited your doctors, who have, um, you know, your issue, who live in your area, uh, who are like you, who are eating similar things as you, what diseases they have. But, you know, if 100 million users are using the uh, app and tracking their foods, even for like three days of the year, if they use it three days a year for 10 years, um, you can really start to see some big picture patterns and that information we would love to give to the users. Like here's the average number of unique value of foods that people typically con uh, you know, consume in a week. And is the number of unique values correlated with the number of nutrition that you have? Um, is the number of unique values like related to like, what about the distribution of foods that people are consuming? Like we don't, we don't have access to any of that information and studies that are conducted now um, at scientific institutions are very biased in like who they're sampling, who they're um, actually able to do the research on. So if consumers are able to just like put this in here, yeah, we would love to do more of that data. So yeah, I will definitely put a slide in that. Thank you. Okay. Oh, one question is for the fundraisers like you do make it seem very simple so like when you say sponsors do you mean like hospital partners or do you mean like investors 
Well, you had sponsored products up here like CPG products. Oh, and okay, CPG many products. Many of the food That's products right. or the articles I read, they're, yeah. they're really driven by, I could tell every third article is really a sponsored article. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm reading about how to cook uh, Mediterranean style food. And then next thing you know, we're looking at the Crusoe, uh, uh, you know, uh, cookware set. And so yeah. uh, the sponsored is really, I think, where a lot of these guys make their money is my suspicion up front, because like I say, they repeat, uh, they uh, and you're writing info articles around them and so forth to put it in there. And then, you know, it, that's just to get you to the market where you can then start to uh, go after the, the consumer side of it. And my idea around monetization is maybe the answer is you're, you're selling the user information that enables them to make better decisions. You're not selling it to some third party. Party, you're just selling it to mm. the users that are paying mm -hmm. the $29 per one day fingerprint. And it's a it's a data set that you're selling them at some at some level. And that, that'll be more interesting to the investors. One issue mm -hmm. about these things is if, if you don't put a name on it, you don't really don't get credit for it. So if you've got a data set that you're building for doing that, you want to put a name on it. What's the name of that product? And that'll mm -hmm. that'll land a lot more with the investor. Okay. Thank gotcha. you. Thank, thank you. you so much, Hall and Lauren. Um, thank you, Lily. Really appreciate this. Just real quick to Lauren's comment on the legal side, you want to make sure that your terms of use and privacy policy are very robust and complete with mm -hmm. different types of disclaimers and liability waivers to, to cover mm -hmm. those areas as well. Um, but that brings us to 12 o'clock. Huge thank you to our three entrepreneurs, to Chris, to Cecil, and to Lily. Terrific. Hopefully you guys found this workshop really helpful. Special thank you to Hall Martin of 10 Capital Group for being our guest judge today. Hall, we're always thrilled to have you. And of course, to Lauren McDaniel, my partner in crime with SeedSpot. Um, always appreciate your incredible insights. As I mentioned, this has been recorded and will be circulated. Uh, please join us for next month's Pitch Masters in February. The link was in the chat. Love to have you join us. And as mentioned, we have spaces if you would like to apply to pitch and participate. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.